Okay, we'll begin prayers. Towards the one, the perfection of love, harmony, and beauty, the only being united with all the illuminated souls who form the embodiment of the master, the spirit of guidance. Can everyone hear me okay? A nod? Perfect, thank you. So today's subject is sublime surrender. Now it also seems appropriate as we enter the Lenten season and Ash Wednesday just passed us. And so I'm gonna have to be looking down and up because my notes have disappeared from the screen. So excuse me as I do that, but I do wanna refer to Mershit's teachings on, on this subject, although he doesn't call it sublime surrender a bit uh, a little autobiographical here. Uh, Pira Murshid, you know, he taught much about the inner life. In fact, I think it was the first book published of his teachings. I know that the inner life was the first book that my teacher, my first initiator and guide, Murshida Viracorda, assigned me to read. And I found it in a little teeny thin paperback. I know it's part of a larger message volume, Sufi message volume one, but I carried that book with me everywhere and it traveled to my on with me on my first trip to India. Well, through this study, I've come to realize that the challenges and uh, difficulties of our lives are, and I say capital letters A-R-E, are the spiritual path unfolding. This is the grist for our spiritual, um, spiritual life, our spiritual unfoldment. Challenges and difficulties are that what Mershid might call ayats, which means clues, little breadcrumbs leading us somewhere. It's the kind of, wait a minute, look here, pay attention to this. And they're the indicators of where the inner work is to be. I mean, let's face it, when things are going really easy, we don't think much about it. But when they're going really hard, we turn to God, right? I mean, that's when we really turn to God. So I think it's an important thing to remember and not get lost in, in whatever difficulties might arise, but to surrender to them and to let them teach us. Well, there are times though, however, in this process, I don't know about you, maybe you're all fortunate enough to not have this happen in your life. But for me, sometimes I get stuck. I feel stuck. And there was a practice, again, uh, early on, not, not one of my first practices, hi, Maria. Uh, Rahima, uh, but it was a one of the beginning practices that Murshida very gave me. I remember in the beginning there was this time that felt like a gestation period, and it lasted for several years. I, I think about eight actually, uh, early on, where it I guess it was a dark night, and um, so she gave me this practice to help get me unstuck. You know, like being on that little gerbil wheel where you feel like you're running as hard as you can or a treadmill but you're not getting anywhere. That was how I felt. So this practice is so beautiful because it, it does help us um, sync up with the divine will, which is a requirement to surrender. The recording, give me a second. Thank you. Um, but the practice is your Wahab. Mershita Vera gave it as Wahabo, Wahabo. She gave the instructions to imagine an emerald green stream flowing through the heart from left to right. And when I've been in other parts of the world with Sufi friends, and we've been near a river or a creek or even an ocean, they say, let's turn, let's let the flow go across our hearts. So I know that this practice is given to others in similar ways in different parts of the world by different teachers. But what we're doing here, what, what does Wahab mean? It actually means um, the bestower of gifts or uh, the divine giver of gifts. But we could also think of it in this way. It's opening to an opportunity. How do we open to an opportunity? And it's an invitation. Think of this, an invitation to enter the flow of God's love-filled grace enter the flow of God's love-filled grace. So it's letting that 
a, you know, sense emptying and allowing the design, divine spirit to flow through us. So let's do this. There's several things I'd like to share with you. So I'm not going to, uh, we would normally do these practices 101 times, but we're gonna accelerate it and we're gonna do it 11 times uh, with the prefix ya, 11 times with a whisper and 11 times silently. And when Rashida Vera gave it to me, she said, make the sound wa-bo-wo-wo-wo-wo-wo-wo to continue the O. So shall we do it together? From left to right, left to right, with this flow of an emerald green water streaming through our heart. ya wa bo ya wa bo Whispering just with blob. Silently on the breath. Life can be recognized. These are the words of Mershad and Nikon. Life can be recognized in two aspects, the known and the unknown. The unknown aspect may be called immortal, the eternal life, and the known aspect may be called mortal life. What we generally know of life is its mortal part, the experiences we have through our physical being, giving us the evidence of life. And therefore, the life that we know is the mortal life. The immortal life exists, but we do not know it. It is our knowledge which is absent. It is not the immortal life which is absent. So how did the Sufis view these two aspects? The known and the unknown. One method may be to examine the two aspects of will. Kaza, Q -U, excuse me, Q-A-Z-A, -A, Kaza, the divine will that is working through all things. Kaza, the divine will that is working through all things and Kader, the free will of the individual. Kaza and Kader Kalam come from the Arabic root Kalam, and this means 
a cut reed for writing. So a pen, a pencil, or a brush. But the esoteric meaning is the pen which God writes upon the heart, providing the source of inspiration. The pen which God writes upon our heart that provides the source of inspiration. So Kaza is the unlimited aspect of life and Kader is the limited, the unknown and the known, the unseen and the seen. Kader draws upon the life of Kaza. Listen to this, it's very important. Kader draws upon, excuse me, yes, Kader draws upon the life of Kaza for its existence. And Kaza waits passively for everything to come into it. So there's this delicate place that's a dance between these two. And one must not fall either this way or that way too deeply. Neither into the unknown or the known, but rather informing each of these through both. So it's crossing, crossing over. So Cotter, therefore, could be considered this active principle, this part of perhaps our will that we use to go to that threshold and draw upon the source of the immortal, the eternal, the are pervading. This is a good use of will versus a the ego, you know, it's, it's we're willing this um, connection to the divine. And Kaza could be considered as this receptive, all pervading, ever eternal, all accepting aspect of will. Divine will. It's unlimited and it's all pervading. Murshid says these words about this. Therefore, the thinkers and wise, those who have been called mystics or Sufis, have discovered the science of how to withhold the experience of life, which alone gives us the evidence of life. And to withhold this from this vacuous, all-pervading space that's always releasing beings into existence, but also absorbing beings into its heart. And there is this science that's discovered that he says how to withhold the experience of life. And if we do not know how to do it, we could fall easily into this all-pervading existence, which of course I think we all touch in our meditations, but it's quite clear we can't live there 24 seven. So having that, as um, Rabia Basra said, eating the bread of, of, of this world, but doing the work of that world. There's many ways that this is said. Merchant says it actually this way, from the, with the that we are, um, the causa it waits with its mouth open, waiting to kind of consume us. I mean, if we think about that, that could be a, a slightly scary thought. So how do we touch that place of all pervading, all knowing, eternal, uh, and bring that into our awareness and understanding of this world so as to not be consumed by this world? I mean, we, we neither want that. So he says, Mershit says, if we do not know how to withhold it, we will fall into the mouth of Kaza, for Kaza is always waiting with the mouth open. And he gives this example, and we all know this is true from our experience. As an illness awaits the moment when a person is lacking energy, haven't we all had this happen? We get overworked, overtired, overstressed, boom, we get something, a cold, a cough, whatever. So he says, as an illness awaits the moment when a person is lacking energy, so in all different forms of causa is waiting to assimilate 
all that comes to it and which then is merged into it. So I'd like to work with these practices. Uh, I, I've turned it into a practice and, and formally, I, I mean, it is correct to say these words with the prefix ya. So we're gonna work with this and then I'm gonna work with it two or three different ways also in the English language. So first we're gonna call upon Kaza and we're gonna draw that in with, um, I wanna just go back and make sure I've made note of everything because this is a little awkward looking up and down. But drawing in the Kaza, calling it to sort of surround us and envelop us without being consumed by it, and then bring it into every cell, every memory, every future possibility of ourselves. We bring it in, we inform our being with it without being consumed by it. So we're gonna work with, in tandem, yakazer, yakater, with the divine will, touching, kissing, sipping our human will, our individuated will, sipping and drawing from, from that. So we'll go, yakaza, yakada, okay? And then we'll again go into the whisper and the whisper will breathe in, God, and breathe out. No, sorry, cause. God. So we're bringing in Kaza and we're infusing our being with it with Kotter. Okay? And then we'll just go silent. And we'll do the practice in English and you'll see it further. So let's seven times. Ya casa, ya car, 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 ya casa, ya car. Now with the whisper, breathing in and breathing out. Silently touching that point, that undulation between those two words on the breath. Breathing in Kaza, breathing out Kaza.
Ja casa, ja casa. Now think of how these two ideas, these two expressions of will relate to this, this phrase from the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You see the connection? You feel the connection? Thy kingdom come, Cotter. Thy will be done, excuse me, Kaza. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, Kaza. On earth as it is in heaven, Kaza. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, Kaza. On earth as it is in heaven, Kaza. So if you choose, you could work with that phrase in the same way on the breath. Breathing in, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, and out. On earth as it is in heaven. Bringing that vibration into your being, your earthly being, and into the earth, into your vibration through you. It also reminds me of this phrase, I'll read the whole poem and then I'll emphasize the prayer um, for the poem by Jalaluddin Rumi, um, but as translated by Coleman Barks. And it, the prayer goes, the breeze at dawn has secrets to tell you. Don't go back to sleep. You must ask for what you really want. Don't go back to sleep. People are going back and forth across the Dorsia, where those two worlds meet. The door is round and open. Don't go back to sleep. So if you've ever had the opportunity, and I'm sure you all have, to sit in a vast space and watch that those moments of dawn as they awaken, making the unseen world visible through light. But we must always remember that subtle undulation of that point from darkness to light, from life to death, from Kaza to God. We must ask for what we really want. Do we want that connection? I think we do. We wouldn't be here together if we did. And we feel it when we're together. We're asked not to go back to sleep. Go back to sleep. We are so easily lulled into sleep by everyday life, by the things of this material world. But we must always keep in mind that this material world is a manifestation of the all-pervading life and space but we don't need to be captivated or captured or held or imprisoned by it. We can recognize that and see the beauty of God's light in all forms and love in all beings. So then we also are told people are going back and forth across the door seal where the two worlds meet. We have Kaza and we have Kader. And there's a doorway there. The door is round and open. We can be informed, we can draw back and forth, experiencing that if we don't go back to sleep. So Merchant goes on to explain, the means by which life draws its power from kaza is breath. Oh my gosh, we spend a lot of time in our practices on breath. It's very, very important. We're given up many, many different forms of breath practice. With every breath, one draws in, one draws life and power and intelligence from the unseen and the unknown life. And that's drawing in cause. And when one knows the secret of posture, 
those of you that have studied yoga or even, you know, I remember in retreats with Pier Vilaya, he gave us very specific postures, ways of sitting while we were breathing or performing waziva. And as I'm sure that many of you have also done those kinds of postures. But for now, just sitting up erect, feeling that connection to the base of our spine, to the crown and beyond, and also our connection to the earth is also very good to be mindful of. And Murshid says, again, when one knows the secret of posture and draws from the unseen world energy and power and inspiration, one gets the power of sustaining one's thought, one's word, one's experiences, one's pleasure, one's joy. Thought power is necessary with both posture and breath to gain physical control. I see that um, in Moynadine's environment, he has these tonkas. And of course, those are used in that way. You meditate upon the physical form. You recite a mantra. You do bring that uh, visualization into your being through the crown and let it reside at the heart with the mantra encircling it. So in that tradition too, in Christianity, we meditate upon the cross. In um, is Islamic architecture in the mosque, there are geometric forms that are showing this undulation. You see the stars moving into kind of a burst and it's this undulation. You know, if you've been to Merchant's Darga, you see that in the carved marble. It's always there teaching us whether or not we're aware of it, but it's there visually and we can synchronize our breath to it. In many religious uh, paintings, we also see it become mindful of it. One must rise. This is, I thought, very important. And I'm glad to touch on this point. This is again from Mershid's words because it has to do with all of this. You know, if we get caught in the individuated preferences, then we become very limited. And he says, one must rise one's likes and one's dislikes, for they cause much weakness in life. When one says, I cannot stand this, I cannot eat this, I cannot drink this, I cannot bear this, I cannot tolerate this, I cannot endure, he says, all these things show weaknesses. The greater the will, now, I have to say I have food allergies, so I'm not talking to those that need to observe. That's not the point. You have to be mindful of that. But, you know, someone will eat something and just merely because the taste is a little too bitter or something, ah, I can't stand that. That's what I'm talking about. You have to observe your own um, body's needs. So Mershit's not talking about that. So let's be clear. But he says the greater the willpower, the more a person is able to stand all that comes along. So we become strong because we can tolerate and, and because we become, what's the word? What's the word Mersha uses? We become indifferent. All things are equal when you're indifferent. It doesn't mean I don't care. We use that word in, in, in the English language as to put someone off. I'm just indifferent to them. That isn't what it means in Mersha's context. It means to have equanimity, to have poise, to be accepting of things, to not choose the, the difference between this and that, or this or that. We accept it all. That's the true meaning of indifference, equanimity. That's what he's talking about. Well, there's this quote that is relative to all of this, and it, it comes from the Hadith of, of Muhammad the Prophet, and it says this, and it has to do with surrender, of course. Oh God, oh Allah, I surrender to you. I believe in you. I rely on you. I return in repentance to you. I seek refuge in your honor, not my honor, in your honor. There is no God but you. We recite this all the time. La ilaha illallah. There is nothing but God, only God exists. You are the ever li living, the one who never dies. Now, this has been adapted. I heard it through Mershav Waliali. 
I know Mershad Waliam, uh, Waliali uh, Mira, God rest his soul. Um, Mershad Mariam Baker gives this practice. And my understanding is that it is an adaptation of this hadith by Mershad Samuel Lewis. It's a beautiful practice. And I'd like for us to, I'd like to share it with you. And I would like us to do it together. The words that were given as this prayer, as this practice is, Ya Allah, in love, reverence, and humility, I surrender to thee and to thee alone, and thou dost fill me spiritually. Now, I'm going to see if I can find the chat. And I think I typed this in, as well as other practices here for you. So if you go to your, I, again, I've lost that view from my screen. Um, it might be under the view uh, chat, you'll see it, but just listen to the words and do the motions with me. You'll catch on, we'll do it about five times. So we say, Ya Allah, or you can say, Oh God, or Divine One, Ya Allah. So we make ourselves a, a receptive chalice here and we bow in love, reverence, and humility. I surrender to thee and to thee alone. And then we go back up into this crescent moon or chalice, allowing ourselves to be filled. And thou dost fill me spiritually. And again, Ya Allah, in love, reverence, and humility, I surrender to thee and to thee alone. And thou dost fill me spiritually. Ya Allah, in love, reverence, and humility, I surrender to thee and to thee alone, and thou dost fill me spiritually. Ya Allah, in love, reverence, and humility, I surrender to thee and to thee alone, and thou dost fill me spiritually. Ya Allah, in love, reverence, and humility, I surrender to thee and to thee alone, and thou dost fill me spiritually. Ya Allah, in love, reverence, and humility, I surrender to thee and to thee alone, and thou dost fill me spiritually. So Murshid goes on to say, elaborating what was said previously, that impulses often weaken us. And when, is, when one, is, one can helplessly give way to them. And, and we see this a lot. We see it in <laughs> consumerism or consumption of overconsumption of foods. Um, you know, just this idea of of more is better, but sometimes it isn't more, it just gives us more to have to take care of and, and be concerned with in this world. He gives the example in his teaching. He says, for instance, when a person has the impulse to go to a park, and instead of waiting until the right time to go to the park, they quickly put on their hat and impulsively and immediately leave. He says, sometimes this can take away one's power. The one who subordinates impulses can control them. They can utilize them for the purpose of developing mastery. We see this in yoga. When you hold an asana for a certain period of time, you can become very strong and the muscles can, in a sense, also get relaxed, elongated and strong. When you come out of that pose, it's almost like falling into a natural meditation when the, when the stress is released, when the impulse is released. So it's important for us to draw upon these various practices, ancient practices. I noticed that when our dog, our new puppy gets up in the morning, the first thing he does is he shakes from head to toe. He like shakes his sleep off. 
And he kind of does that at night too, like as if he's just shaking off the stress of the day and releasing it for sleep. And the next thing he does, and honestly, I didn't ever know a dog's tongue was this long. I've had a lot of dogs, but his tongue is very long, goes way out and curves up. It's about that far and I'm not kidding. And then he puts it back in and he does that a couple of times while he's doing the downward dog pose. So I try to do that with him because I think he's teaching me, you know, this is how the, the yogis learn. They learn their ragas from listening to the birds. They learn their yoga from watching the animals. And so this is a great thing. I mean, this is a natural way he's doing downward dog right now with his tail curled up, but he is, uh, He's a good teacher. They're good teachers if we allow them to be that impulse of the divine is coming through nature all the time. Of course, Marcia talks about the holy manuscript of nature. But anyway, holding our impulses, because sometimes I bet you if we really are mindful of it, we can see that when we're impulsive about something, it brings about um, perhaps an ill felt fate of some kind, or perhaps we don't feel so good about ourselves, which is also an ill fate. And we, we can have regret, but if we can learn from that regret, like the prayer above where if we have this repentance, you know, I return in repentance to you, you know, we can offer that up as a prayer as well and make a commitment. Pierre Valiant, I think almost every time I did retreat with him, he, at one point of the retreat, he'd make us kneel on one leg, the other knee, you know, foot was down, and then we had to take like we had a sword in our hand. And we had to like make this pledge, you know, of, of surrendering our, our will, cutting through that so that we could be receptive to the divine will, but also that we were like these knights. I mean, I think Piers has kind of continued that vein with this chivalry and knighthood concentration, but you know, this idea of being a knight, a knight for something greater than ourselves, serving something greater than ourselves. And he would make us make this commitment. It seemed like to me, it was always early in the morning. The same thing I'd been with His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, when he was about to begin a teaching. And, and before they began, we'd all be, be assembled about 3.30 in the morning in the courtyard where His Holiness would teach. This is in India, of course. And the same gesture on one knee, vowing he would give us the bodhisattva vows so you know one has to think that you know this these kinds of mm, these kinds of gestures these kinds of prayers they've existed in all the different traditions not just in not just in a sufi tradition not just in a christian tradition not just in judaic tradition they're there they're there everywhere so we need to look at that that's what the beauty of the unity of religious ideal studies can give us so anyway, I'm talking a lot, but it's my time, right? So I get to. So I'm going to go on now. And I, there's one more practice, but I want to use some of Mershit's words leading up to it. And it again has to do with breath and posture. And we'll do this one practice that some of you may be familiar with. I wasn't until um, Mershit Hadayat, an icon, taught it to me. And I'll explain why he taught it to me. It might be of great benefit to you as well. So... Your Merchant and Night Khan says this. Um, yeah, we've talked about that impulses can weaken a person. But he says, <clears throat> if we can control those impulses, impulses, we can gain mastery. If we can sustain um, um, our desire for pleasure, sometimes withholding that can give us a greater glory. And again, mastery is a great thing to accomplish in one's life, not just for one's benefit, but it gives us the ability to do things for many, many people and to be helpful and useful. In the world. So Mershit goes on to say, therefore, it is most necessary for the human race to develop patience in all conditions. And this, of course, is related to this I don't like this, I like this, I can't tolerate this, the previous um, words of merchants. He says, therefore it's most necessary for the human race to develop patience in all conditions, in all walks of life, in all positions in life. Whether we are rich or poor, high or low, this is the one quality that must be developed, patience. It is patience that gives endurance. It is patience 
that is all powerful. And by lack of patience, one loses so much. Very often the answer to one's prayer is within one's reach. The hand of providence, capital P, hand of providence is not very far off, but one has lost one's patience and so lost the opportunity. So what we ask for, divine providence, we must be patient, but also we must be awake because sometimes the response comes in an entirely different way of what we thought we needed. And are we mindful of that? And can we feel the blessing of that? It's one of the dearest things in life. Merchant goes on to say, all such things as mastery and patience are acquired by physical culture. Physical control can build a foundation for character and personality. And you know, those of you that have really studied Mershit's teachings, this is the most fundamental, the art of character building and the art of personality. This is, this is the Sufi path, really. And he says, physical control can build a foundation for character and personality, a foundation to be built in order to bring about spiritual attainment. And again, our spiritual attainment is not just for our own glory, it's to share and to be of assistance to others. So now I'd like to give this stretch breath and we have time. Um, yeah, I'm just kind of interested. Can you see your little icon, your reactions below? I'm interested how many people have done the stretch breath. Maybe a few. Anyway, so this breath is a breath and it has also to do with this, mm, a kind of withholding, holding an impulse because our natural inclination is we breathe in and breathe out. And if we're blessed, that swing is equal. It, it often isn't. And by observing when it isn't, we can actually do a lot to heal and balance ourselves. But in this breath, we are purposefully extending the exhalation while retaining the same inhalation. And this is so important because what it helps us do is really get control of the breath. And as we're exhaling, we can exhale. Mersha Hadai, it's taken it all the way up to 25 or 30 counts on the exhale that's long. But if we don't go inhale and then exhale and then keep trying to breathe out, we won't be exhausted. We'll actually be expanded. And so therefore we can, and the breath is always in through the nose and out through the mouth in this practice. It's like very slow release of the breath, letting it go out at a long distance in all directions. Also very helpful for those of you that are working with the healing concentration. You can project that breath. But what it also does is it builds this capacity. We become stronger. I have had, um, since 1993, some of the, those that are really close to me have bared witness to this. Mm, sometimes I can have, uh, through in spiritual practice, I can sometimes have a reaction of um, an altered state, which also results in kind of a shaking. And I find that for myself, it's not altogether unpleasant, but I also have a consideration when in community, when this happens, to not worry people. So I asked Marsha the Diet. By the way, I asked everyone I knew. I have a long list of people, names you would know too. No one could give me a, a really good response to this, but Marsha and Hadiat understood it. And without hesitation, he said, well, you need to do the two things. Well, you need to do the stretch breath and you need to do Marsha's there's that shake. Did you hear it? Could you hear? Could you hear my doggy shake with his tags? That was that shake of his. Anyway, 
Um, he said, sometimes we become like these pressure cookers. And if we don't know how to release that energy, it can result in this, not shaking the way the dog's doing it, the shaking like a tremor. Um, and you've seen maybe some people do this in um, spiritual practice when the energy rises. It has to be dispersed somehow. The stretch breath can do it. Now, here's the other thing. If you're a really busy person, which probably most of us are, and you have a lot of things to do, if you stop to do the stretch breath, you'd be surprised how much you can accomplish, how quickly and how easily and with grace, everything just gets done. So this is a valuable breath to, to work with on a daily basis, if you so wish. And it's very simple. And, um, and I always have a study guide on our website. It's sufi-message.org. And then there's a section that you click on for teachings. And then it's like archives of teachings. So you'll always be able to find anything I give there, as well as the audio and the uh, video. So here's the breath. I'm going to give you the instructions. And we're going to do it together. And I'll keep count so you don't need to worry about it. But we're going to breathe, breathe in. And let me explain it first. And then we'll do it. We're going to breathe in excuse me, to the count of four. Then we're gonna breathe out to the count of six. Then we're gonna breathe into the count of four. And we're gonna breathe out to the count of eight. We're gonna breathe into the count of four. We're gonna breathe into the count of 10. We're gonna progress up, let's go to 22, because I love that number. And then we're gonna go back down. Now, if anyone has trouble with this, stop at the point where you feel comfortable. So if that for you is 12, just wait till we return back to you, because we're gonna go up by stretching the breath and then we're gonna return back again. So we'll go from 422, 424, all the way back to 46 again, okay? Shall we try it, see how it feels for you? You should feel expanded, relaxed, and have clarity. All right, so let's breathe in with maybe three, um, sort of three strong exhalations, really clearing the lungs out and expanding them. So first we'll breathe in very strongly. We're going to breathe out. Rashida Vera always said, keep breathing out even when you think you can't. She would, she would say, bend over and cough. <laughs> she always have us do that. Now we're going to breathe again. And we're going to breathe out. One more time, deep breath in. Feel those wings, feel those wings sort of expanding up through your, even your shoulders, all that expanding. Let yourself expand. Slip in and breathe out. Empty, empty, surrender, let it go. And then come into the natural spring, swing of your breath for a few moments and try to sit in a comfortable position, but an alert position. And we'll breathe in for out six. In four. Out eight. And pausing here for just a moment, because another key thing is that you use all that breath when you're ex ex um, exhaling. Don't hang on to it because you won't be able to fill up with the next fresh breath. So there's an element of control and understanding that ex expulsion of the breath and then that drawing it in quickly and then extending it, but not extending it so much on those initial few breaths that we can't really draw a fresh breath in. So let's begin again and keep that in mind. So even as you're breathing out six, you kind of want to get rid of that breath. But when you're breathing out 22, you want to let it last. Okay, so let's try again. Breathe in four. Out six through the mouth, 
in four, out eight. In four, out 10. In four, out 12. In four, out 14. In four, out 16. In four, out 18. In four, out 20. In four, out 22. In four, out 20. In four, out 18. In four, out 16. In four, out 14. In four, out 14, I think. In four, out 12. In four, out 10. In four. Out 10. In four, out eight. In four, out six. And so observe the breath. How does it feel? How does your body feel? Look into the mind. What are the feelings that arise? What's the atmosphere around you?
Murshid Anayat Khan tells us this. The work of the Sufi is to take away the fear of death. The path is trodden in order to know what, excuse me, the path is trodden in order to know in life what will be with us after death. As it is said in another hadith, muta kubla antamuta, or die before death. This is the grace of sublime surrender. Mm, maybe I'll post it on the website. Um, there's this beautiful uh, Bernini sculpture that's in Rome. And that sculpture is St. Teresa of Avila. Look it up. I think it's, um, it's called the Ex Ecstasy of St. Teresa. And there she is in this exalted spiritual state. She's fallen backwards. Her hands are extended like this. I don't know, you can't see me. And she's kind of, her eyes are back and up. And here is this angel, winged angel, with a spear going right into her heart. That's sublime surrender. Sublime surrender. Murshid says the whole mystical path is that play, that playing with death, that moving towards kata, ka, kaza and bringing it in into the kata. You know, that whole not mistaking reality, the big R. He says this, to take off this mortal garb, to teach the soul, that it is not this mortal, but that immortal being, so that we may escape the disappointment which death brings. This is what is accomplished in the life of a Sufi. And if we remember the last line of the prayer known uh, as the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi, also known as the prayer for peace, the last line says, it is dying that we are born to eternal life. That has so many layers and implications, but worthwhile to contemplate as thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, as Kaza and Kader. I hope this has been a benefit to you. And I know preparation has been of great grace and uh, benefit to me. I hope that some of that has been conveyed here today. And I'm wondering if we shall close with the prayer katum. And then if there's any time, Winnie and I probably took up all the time, but if anyone would like to stay for question and answer and sharing of practices and and uh, anything that might be uh, arising in the moment. I'll stay with you for a while. O oh, thou who art the perfection of love, harmony, and beauty, Lord of heaven and earth, open our hearts that we may hear thy voice, which constantly cometh from within. Disclose to us thy divine light, which is hidden in our souls, that we may know and understand life better. Most merciful and compassionate God, give us thy great goodness. Teach us thy loving forgiveness. Raise us above the distinctions and differences which divide equanimity and difference. Raise us above the distinctions and differences which divide. Send us the peace of thy divine spirit and unite us all in thy perfect being. Amen.